gonna do it <laughs> <laughs> my name is eric and i'm here today with don piano and michael kester and uh we got a couple couple films that are i guess children's films made by hey what the fuck are you doing making children's yeah. films yep that's uh that's about right we've got spy kids which is a robert rodriguez joint sure uh, yeah and then we have um Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, which is technically not, but absolutely is, a Stuart Gordon, Brian Usna joint. Yeah, you like to use the word joint a lot, but if you're ever going to use it, it's Stuart Gordon and Brian Usna. And Joe Johnston, you know, made the movie. He's important, too. Uh, we just love our Stuart Gordon, and we just can't help it. These are movies that we are going to spoil. And uh, the thing about spoiling a film is you can't unspoil it, unless your brain is as poorly wired as mine is, and don't remember what happens three days after you watch a movie. Not foreshadowing for our show. I have notes. We'll be fine. You can skip over uh, me reading through notes and <laughs> chapters. Yep. And see, I don't even remember week to week how this part of the show goes. Yeah, this is easily the worst part of the show every week. Use the chapters. Skip this part of the show. Also, send us some emails about chapters. We really need to know your feedback on chapters. Oh, God. The thing about chapters is you can use them. Spy Kids <laughs> is uh is the first chapter. Can we just talk about the cast? Let's just get this out of the way right now. Okay, this is a long list, isn't it? I'm going to say Carla Gugino uh -huh. is probably the name I forget to reference the most, but okay. shouldn't. She was um Lucille in Sin City. She was way, way, way back on the very first episode of Double Feature. Eric. Singing Detective. She's yeah. in The Singing Detective. Sure. She's in Watchmen. She's in a lot of stuff. I don't know She's why. She's amazing. I she was in Electrolux, um, yeah. which is that kind of, it's the sequel to Women in Trouble. Yes. She's great. She's a great, great actor, and she's gorgeous. And she's a mom. She's not Cheech Marin, and that's right. probably why I forget. Well, Cheech Marin and Antonio Banderas and yeah. uh, uh, Danny Trejo play mustache spies yeah, in right. Spy Kids, which is, uh, that's the trio of characters who are spies because they have mustaches. Sure. Um, is that them, official Spy Kids canon or are you making that up? Apparently, the, the, the mustache goes on and the spy goes on. I wish there was an official tome of Spy Kids canon, like there is for Star Wars films or sure. any large franchise has that kind of... There's got to be a Spy Kids wiki online. Oh, there better be. There will be by the time the show goes up. I'll fucking tell you that. A uh, President Clooney is part of that oh, universe. Yeah. That's With an his important glasses. part. Oh god, that's great. Alexa Vega, who you know, Alexa Vega and Daryl Sabara come up on our show, but they come up because they were because on of Spy, Spy Kids. Kids. Yeah. yeah. So where else have we seen these two actors? Alexa Vega was in Repo. Yeah, she was in Repo. Um, Daryl Sabara was a couple weeks back on World's Greatest Dad. He's sure. in Rob Zombie's Halloween. He's in Machete. Sure. He's all over the place. Um, Alan Cumming doesn't show up on our show nearly often enough. We haven't, That's because we haven't covered X-Men. Yeah. <laughs> Gotta find a way. That's what you should actually email us. Come up with a good mechanic for us to cover X-Men, and we'll reject it and then not do X-Men. That's a shame. Then there's Tony uh, Shalhoub. Yeah, who is? Uh, well, he's Minion in this, but yeah. he's Monk. Um, and uh, have we seen Tony Shalhoub on the show before? I don't think so. Okay. So this is the, the beginning of Tony Shalhoub. Sure, sure. It's actually really bizarre to see him in such a small role in anything, but not as bizarre as it is to see Terry Hatcher not being Lois Lane. Oh, my God. Well, and, and Coraline was another oh, uh, that's Terry right. Hatcher spot. Yeah, but yeah, the fucking Superman stuff. The other longstanding Superman uh, TV show not called Superman. Directors Mike Judge, Richard oh, Linklater Mike Judge, that's are right. in this. Uh, Robert Patrick from Terminator yeah, 2 is Even in a this. smaller role. Uh, Dick Clark is in this fucking movie. Who is, is he? not in? Yeah, he's one of the investors. Oh, my God. Yeah, you can't. I mean, basically everyone is in Spy Kids. Um, Antonio is in Spy Kids as a sweater and glasses wearing father, uh -huh. which is uh, a role I have never seen him in before. <laughs> we've, seen, we've seen him as a father. Yeah. Uh, but he was far suaver. In the misbehaviors, uh -huh. which doesn't star the kids from Spy Kids. A no. little surprising to me. Uh, I guess that was years before. He, um, I mean, he is a mustache spy. That's his career. That's what Antonio yep. Banderas does. I mean, he does a lot of things, but I think of him from the Desperado stuff, which sure. certainly at the time was So you don't think of doing. him from Interview with the Vampire then? 
No, Mustache Vampire is not. That was the beginning of Antonio Banderas on our show, wasn't it? I think it was, yeah. Probably. It was early Whoops. enough. Oh, sorry about that, man. It's because we don't do we didn't do that double feature I recommended about Nasenex. Another episode for another year. He uh he gets into a little bit of a fight at school, that kind of imaginary I fight. I love that. The little Spanish guitar riff uh-huh. plays. That is Antonio Banderas right there. I like seeing him wearing a sweater. I think that's a good look for him. I think I like him in this role. I think Antonio Banderas is underrated as a comedic actor. He is. Yeah, I think he's he really understands funny. comedic timing and the kind of um slapstick overacting that sure. it really requires to be a comedic actor. Sure. And I mean that's a lot of that is in part to Robert Rodriguez's understanding of comedic sure. you know timing and comedic pacing and just the whole over exaggeration of comedy to yeah. make it poignant and funny. Yeah, it's great to look at uh his spy moments in here and then moments in Desperado. Desperado being a little serious but still funny. Sure. It was. Uh, it's just a funny comedy. It doesn't rely on one liner. Desperado really should be champion for. We could do a whole nother show on yeah. fucking Desperado. If only there were two more movies in that franchise. People will never get rid of Robert Rodriguez on double feature. He just as long as he makes seven movies a year, there yep. will always be a spot. Eventually, we'll just be pairing him up with Rob Zombie's albums, commercials. The best part about the first Spy Kids is not just the cast, but that the uh, the sum is greater than its parts. Yeah. You know, seeing all these people come together and the things they do, it's not just a oh, children's movie has a actor in sure. it that I like. It really makes for a, a fantastic fucking movie. Well, and the thing that I think is strong about Spy Kids, and I mean, it's as strong as it is brave, mm-hmm. is that you have this behemoth cast of, especially when it came out, very famous people. Sure. And the film doesn't rely on any of them. The film's no. entire crux lies on these two children. Yeah. The film is based on these two, and they're nobody actors at this point. You know, this is the first Spy Kids movie. Alexa Vega and Daryl Sabara have not sure. been in anything. They're classic Robert Rodriguez screen tested actors. Yeah. Um, when um when later on he did Shark Boy and Lava Girl, he let his son pick them by sure. meeting them. Sure. Um, I'm sure this is very similar. He had them come in. He sat down with them, spoke to them, and made sure he related to them on an adult level. And that's a lot of what the film is, is it's treating these children like they have as much weight as adults. Sure. And they do. That's what makes Spy Kids great is that it's not it's not a kid's film for adults. It's not fucking Shrek. Yeah. Where although Antonio Banderas. Yeah. Right. um, Or we'll put a couple dirty jokes in that kids won't get. And then adults will not fall asleep during the film. You see in every review of every computer animated film fucking yep. movie yep. is oh you know it's for kids but adults will love it too yes. ha, ha, ha. you'll you yeah. won't be bored taking your kid fuck you this is why i hate reviews fuck Just you copy and paste that shit every time that movie comes out you know when when i see a kid's film you know what i want the audience to be eric what kids yeah the kids children's films are not made so that adults enjoy them well, we can always go back to when we did shorts, right. and uh, you and me and our producer went, and we were the only adults yeah. in the uh, movie but theater. I don't think kids' films for adults. I think that that's an absolute waste of time. Sure. Make a grown-up film and make a kids' film. Sure, Spy Kids is the perfect example of making a film for kids where there's uh, a joke. Okay, so there's a joke um, buried in Spy Kids where the robot voice says, "Now flushing." Your poop. Yeah. And it's impossible yeah, not to yeah, laugh. Yeah. It's one of the funniest moments in the film. Yeah, and it's really good. You can't... It's That's not a grown-up joke. Sure. It's a joke that kids are going to crack up at. It's Shiitake also... Shiitake mushrooms, a yeah, right. staple of the Spy Kids <laughs> franchise. It is, it is. It's That's a kid's joke. Well, and these were a lot more Robert Rodriguez written than the other Spy Kids movies. Right. I think this is the... Let's call this the best treatment of scatological humor in the uh-huh. Spy Kids franchise. That's probably true. When I go back and watch the first Spy Kids movie, I kind of bounce around. I'll watch different ones in the series at different moments, depending on who I'm with and which ones Uh they were convinced to see by their other friends. Right. And when I get back to the first one, that's always a moment where I go, wow, they were a lot more subtle about that poop joke. Right. As opposed to the diaper bomb in Spy Kids 4. It's really an evolution of scatological humor (laughs) throughout the franchise. The parents are used heavily in the beginning before they hand things over to the kids. Sure. We get the uh, the bedtime story, which, I mean, I would watch a whole fucking movie of. 
It's so seeing. So you're saying that you would like to see a movie about one of the adult characters in Spy Kids as the same character, but all right. So maybe I have that. Maybe those films totally exist. But you know, you get this glimpse of what a straight Rodriguez spy movie yeah. would look like if it were an actual, not just action guitar case full of weapons, but an actual sure. spy movie. And you know, cutting back and forth to Alexa Vega's character. And having her interjections of where she would like the story to go, and the, as if uh-huh. she's never been told the story. Right. Every moment of every scene in that is fucking funny. Every single moment. There is not a single frame of wasted space yep. in that flashback, or really anywhere in the in Spy Kids. Everything is funny or exciting or has some kind of charm to sure. it. Well, and it brings to light this idea that Spy Kids takes advantage of, which is... There are these genres of film in the world. Nobody's a stranger to this. We're a film podcast. But what if you made kids do it? You have sure. new genres immediately right. popping up. Take our uh, our quintessential slasher outline. Group of sexually active teenagers go into the woods, are killed by an adult. Change that to group of mischievous children go into the woods, are killed by another child. Yeah, right. That's a complete... I would go see that movie. Especially if Robert Rodriguez did it, yeah. right? All you I need mean, to do you is, take... is you can treat children like adults. Kids get it. They yeah. can act. They can They can portray the same... They're human beings. They're just yeah. little ones. Yeah, We sure. talk about Human shitty... beings only smaller. Right. <laughs> Sorry. We talk about shitty child actors and how we hate them. We talk about it all the time, but honestly, more often than not on the show, and this is to be completely fair, we talk about how good they are. Yeah, that happens a lot. We doesn't hate it? them generally, but specifically, they're amazing. In the movies we hand select, they're always the greatest child actor. Yeah, so there might be enough of them to say, make films with. Go you think? fucking figure. So you have created a genre here. Or- sure. Many genres. You uh-huh. just take any type of child exploitation, dare you I just say. <laughs> make it with. A spaghetti western but yeah. using just kids right instead. and it's not to say it's not to say kids in grown-ups roles like i don't want to see a kid as a bartender i kind of do but real that, spaghetti only smaller but i'm can just you gonna keep using that. that just add only smaller to any <laughs> but type you, of why film. would the kid be a bartender i don't know town? it doesn't matter it's a juice bar who cares well as long as as long as across the board the special effects are completely handled as if nobody gives a shit <laughs> right hey these are the early days of uh, no. Computer animation. No, there's really no excuse for this. The is early there? days of computer animation are the lawnmower man. This Uh-oh. is 10 years following. <laughs> are you sure it's 10 years? Because the visual effects, <laughs> I to disagree. So, it's, it's cartoonish, right? Yeah. It blends in with the aesthetic well, of the who movie. Are you, who are you fooling? You're fooling six-year-olds. Yeah. They just have to believe that it looks cool. They don't have to believe that it's real. I don't even think these are the as bad as the special effects get. This no. is just like the poop jokes. Right. They are it's true. Far superior here and then eventually um I think find their own. I don't even want to say they get worse. I think they just embrace Well, uh, I think the rationale, the the blanket rationale behind Spy Kids is finding its audience and making a film for that audience. It's sure. what we love Robert Rodriguez for, right? Sure. We're talking about how it's strange that he makes a kids film. But the reality of the situation is Robert Rodriguez is very good at knowing his audience and sure. making a film to please them. That's yeah. why Machete was such a big deal when it was coming out, because he knew people wanted it. Yeah. That's why he made it. That's why the trailer sparked sure. the interest and sure. it became what it did. Spy Kids, he knows it's for his children. He yeah. knows what his kids like. He knows that audience. Sure. He's not making a film to please a mass of people. His ideology is if the kids like it, this is a success. Yeah, this isn't because it's easy for right. him. This, I mean, it probably is easy for him, but that's not, you know, oh, I'll just sleep through directing this children's film so I can make a quick buck. I mean, you can see his excitement for the genre in everything that's going on in the movie. It's just overflowing with ideas. Yeah. There's ideas. I mean, the, the set design alone like the safe house yep. and the way everything flips around and then all the gadgets sure. and devices. And Floop's and, entire castle. Floop's TV yeah. show with the Danny sure. Elfman theme. Sure. We have a Floop TV show. Why? What? Yeah. Just because. Because that would be I great. I yeah. would watch a Robert Rodriguez helmed Floop's Fooglies TV show well, we as long another... as it starred Mike Judge, not as the voice of Butthead. It's another double feature. We just need a Floop's uh, TV movie. With Nasen X. I was going to say straight spy, but you know what? Uh, Nasen X, that's fine too. You get this feeling that there is more to take in than they're really allotting time for. Right. It's the opposite of stretching your premise uh, too thin. It's just, you know, slow the fuck down. It's as if the movie's running ahead of you. Well, it's got to keep the children entertained. A lot of times that could just mean 
fast edits or a bunch of flashy nonsense. And this is these are concrete, oh, hey, wasn't that clever right. kind of ideas, not even one per scene or one per frame. Every time you're looking at a scene, there's 20 of them that all pop out of it. You hit a button and 30 things flip around with cool, crazy ideas that you don't even explore and you just move on. Right. This is why this is begging for its own canonical uh, collection sure. of Spy Kids lore is because there's so much here. It's a better film than I am an audience. I cannot comprehend. I love that. That's, you know, that's the formula. Make a better film than your audience is ready for. Run ahead of your audience. A lot of the humor, too, is based on cinematic reveals. It's, uh, you know, the mustache gadget is right. one of the best jokes in the whole thing. And it's because you don't expect it, but it's also the cinematic moment where there's a gadget and whatever. And that makes it funny. Or the, the thing where the, uh, the floor appears right. to fall out. Sure. And you're seeing it and we're dealing with, oh, this is where you got to cross the canyon thing and it's falling and, whoa, adventure, Indiana Jones. And then it's just a piece of plexiglass. Mm hmm you're showing things with your camera or you're relying on the audience's previous knowledge of these other films. And then you're creatively putting a spin on that. And that's where the humor is. Even the jokes have to be creative like that. Another really a staple of the spy kids franchise. I mean, normal things are spy technology. You are surprised by, Oh, this item or this item or this item that you thought were normal household things. I mean, that's kind of spy stuff in, in general. That's right. why, spies perfect thing to make a children's film out of because you have all these unique little surprises these unique little items these unique little nightmare before christmas besides did not anticipate that uh the first time i saw this movie you and i are both nightmare before christmas oh, yeah. fans well i mean i i like danny elfman everything oingo Which boingo makes us oingo boingo fans, fans yeah right uh makes us danny elfman fans I think at this point, you and I are probably bigger Oingo Boingo fans than Danny Elfman score fans. That's true. Big time. But man, you get uh, the Nightmare Before Christmas soundtrack was one of the, the greatest kind of sure. combining a few of those yeah, different absolutely. things. Danny Elfman does it alone. You get a singing voice. Danny Elfman also shows up and just does a song in the sure. Spy Kids movie. And like everything else, this is a brief glimpse into a creative idea that could have been further strung out. Right. And uh, no, we're just going to show you. We don't even get the whole fucking song, man. Right. We get 30 seconds of the song. Hey, I wrote a song for you, an original Danny Elfman song. You can use it in your, oh, cool. Yeah, we'll uh, just stick the first 25 seconds in. That's nice. Cut to something else. I'm bored. The rest of the music, too. There's, um, you know, so there's some of the Robert Rodriguez wrote the right. score. You get the Los Lobos stuff. They wrote uh, some stuff for Desperado as well. From a Rodriguez standpoint, you're getting that usual kind of writing, editing, that stuff. But this is the last movie he did on film. Huh. You and I, uh, every time we see a Rodriguez movie, we kind of go, where does this fall? Is this the last film one? Because he became a big digital guy. Right. And after this, it was all digital from, from then on. And so he was working at one of the Lucas houses for sound engineering or maybe it's visual effects. And I think it was Lucas himself who kind of went, ah, digital filmmaking. Are you aware of any of this? Have you seen this? And that kind of became, I mean, Robert Rodriguez was already a pretty big name and doing a lot of uh, notable things. Mm -hmm. But then he became an early proponent of make films digitally. It's something the entire industry is doing now. Sure. So a, a lot of the thing that uh, Spy Kids covers, and yes, we're going to talk about some of the themes in the Spy Kids <laughs> films. Um, in the third the, installment of the Spy Kids franchise, <laughs> this is actually kind of happening now, um, is uh, this idea of importance of family and you are sure. a Cortes and, yeah. you know, that that whole mentality. And um, that's I mean, that's your standard children's movie fair. Only in this film, it fucking matters. Yeah, sure. Spying is in your blood. Yeah. And the reason you are doing such a good job is because your parents were spies. And if you believe in yourself as a spy, you will do okay because sure. it's in your blood. Yeah. And you're from a spy family and your family's looking out for you because despite the fact that they're your blood relatives, it's your peers having your back. Sure. And it's a cute little kitschy thing that their peers happen to all be families and, oh, we need another person for the other hundred. Yeah. Oh, thank God Uncle Machete swings yeah, right. through the window. Yeah. But, Good thing I wrote that character in. <laughs> but what it also goes to say is that in a more general sense, you know, spies, anybody, 
you need to pay attention to who's around you and other people have your back. And that's kind of the greater message to the film. Sure. Although you wouldn't think so with the uh, antagonists of the film. Yeah, Because right. you have... That what, didn't work out so well You there. have basically Pee Wee Herman and Pee Wee Herman's producer. Sure. And they seem to be on the same team. <laughs> yeah, they do. Well, the minion floop thing is another piece that just makes this so unique. It's not so much a, a henchman kind of dynamic as... We think everything's about Floop. We find out this is sort of a weird partnership they yeah. have. It seems like Minion is really in control and using Floop as a puppet. Right. That's kind of where we sure. arrive at. Well, and it, I mean, there's the obvious deceptive nature of his name being Minion. Yeah, right. I mean, that is <laughs> right. right off the Throw bat. off a little bit there. His name is Minion. It allows that descent, though. It allows Minion to take the lead when you have... A, a partnership of villains like that they can disagree mm -hmm. and in those disagreements i mean i wish this became a, a cinematic cliche i sure. wish this was something where all bad guy evil villains were now partnerships that disagreed sometimes well, and had to have the, a debate about how to be evil that's awesome yeah that's that's kind of the brilliant thing about two evil people who disagree is that bad people will just turn on you yeah right good people you know your family your your sure. peers and your friends they're gonna stick with you even when you do something stupid or you sure. make a dumb mistake they're not gonna go oh i disagree with you never mind we're not on the same side anymore sure but villains it takes very little for them to decide no never mind i'm on my own i'm taking this solo you're wrong you're my enemy Although you do see kind of a realistic disagreement in the Machete character, in Uncle Machete. Right, but it comes down to family is family and sure. good people look out for good people. Yeah. But right, you get this whole, the whole Machete, He's ombre gone astray, dynamic. Though. Yeah. Right. He's the businessman who's kind of separated from the family and his job now is to make the creative things is to go, okay, these little spy gadgets, we realize this is a thing we can latch on to kids like this it's good for the movie why don't we talk to the guy who makes the spy gadgets that right. would be that's where you go in that universe of course you want to talk to that guy i'm glad the movie's aware enough to make that a central character and so he's had a falling out and he gives the kids a chance um character wise to demonstrate they're not just following the plan of the adults right this isn't just well the adults are absent we're going to follow kids around but they're doing what the adults want Uncle Machete makes this call that, you know, he kind of disagrees with them. And they say, uh, fuck it, we're going to take this plane thing and right. we're going to get the fuck out of here. Yeah, so they have their own plan and they're going to do it with or without his help. Sure. And, you know, he comes back because they need him and they tie him back into the story for the same reason he left. I don't remember what that is. I love that. Just another one of my favorite lines of this. Just throw away who gives a fuck. But this is all stuff specific to this character. What really needs to be said, or maybe doesn't need to be said, is Uncle Machete. Uncle Machete, Machete. Danny Trejo Machete in right. the Spy Kids universe. Yeah. In the, I guess, the Rodriguez universe. Right. Years and years before this Machete thing happened, because the idea of Machete was, hey, there should really be a exploitation movie with Danny Trejo. Ah, that'll never happen. I'll just make him Uncle Machete. In the, it, it became a kind of joke of the Rodriguez right. universe that turned into its own movie. It's just so beautiful because of fan reaction, because people wanted that. I wanted to ask you something uh, really fucking selfish. How do you get people to watch this movie? How do you convince your friends to watch Spy Kids? You know, my friends... You do have to convince them, right? You, yeah, you do. It's really easy. You just show them uh, You show them Machete, you show them Planet Terror, and you show them Desperado. Uh -huh. And then you say, this guy made a kids film. Yeah, yeah I guess, and it's, I guess it's, it's that easy. It's That's less, how I saw it. It's less... You should watch Spy Kids with me because once you say Spy Kids, they remember Spy Kids from when it came out and they go, yeah. really? Spy Kids? Are you yeah. serious? But if you tell them that the Planet Terror guy made a kids movie, sure. their immediate response is, I want to see kids with guns for legs. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Yeah, and I feel like it still delivers in yeah. a, a noticeably different but more surprising way than you would, Agreed. you would expect. That's a much better method than my current... Listen, you watch the first 10 minutes of this movie, and if you don't like it, then we don't have to watch it. And that, that always works, but there has to be the initial buy-in. Sure. There's always the, what do I get out of this bet? I've still yet to come up with anything. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids is uh, another movie. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids is 90s family sci-fi adventure. Yeah, it's getting there. It's, uh, it's the 90s before the 90s happened. Right. So what it is, is 1989, and 
Rick Moranis is texting from the attic about breakfast. Uh-huh. That's what this movie is. It's the end of uh, we're not quite in this age of technology and wonder yet. That would come, you know, a full 10 years later. Sure. When these gadgets would be appreciated by everyone, mass appeal. But we're just getting out of the 80s, weird science, kind of uh, that yeah, fascination. Real genius and the whole... Yeah, yeah, right, right. The mad science. that Whatever happened to 80s mad science? Yeah, it's kind of this weird thing because I think it just it got on some weird fast track and turned into films for grownups. Yeah. Um, four years after Honey, I Shrunk the Kids was Jurassic Park. Oh, yeah, uh, sure. Which, to me, is one of the ultimate look what science can do in film. Sure. Um, and a lot of tie-ins. And, Way, yeah. Tons of tie-ins with <laughs> Honey, I Shrunk sure. the Kids, Jurassic and, Park. And, and you just get this idea of, in the 80s, it's mad science, and for whatever reason, they're trying to explain it as if there's something to say. But because it's so cartoonish and because grown-ups don't really believe that you can do because sure. science doesn't happen to adults. Right, right. Um, you just, it gets written off as it's, I don't know, maybe motivational to kids' wild imaginations sure. or some such bullshit. Well, it treats science the, the same way that uh, Mr. Wizard or the kind of Bill Nye the science guy that yeah. let's get kids Beacon's excited world. about science. But, well, they took, they took those shows that said, let's get kids excited about science and they dumped the science part, which was the part that was actually working. Right. And they picked up the goofy fucking part yeah. that was a thing you put up with so you could see the cool science part and uh, and ran with that. And I think that's how that 80s thing was created. I could totally see that. It was just goofy beakers and smoke coming out. And, and we used that to the same 80s formula of those those other things. I mean, I kind of feel like the place it went was 90s sci-fi. Yeah. Because it disappeared for 10 years or something before sure. we found another reinvention of weird science. I'm just going to keep saying yeah. weird science. It's so perfect. I mean, there's there isn't a better well, spot. And the thing about all of these films is that they they try to make the science seem rational. Sure. They they have this grand premise of Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, which, I mean, it went through like six title changes. Sure. It was called uh, Teeny Weenies. Oh, was it? Uh, yeah. Um, but then it was rejected because they were afraid that it would be for too childish of oh, an sure. audience. So there was the right. backyard and then the small people or some uh, grounded <laughs> was one of them. Sure. All horrible titles. Terrible yeah. job, Stuart. <laughs> oh, blame Brian. But eventually they went with Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Sure. Um, and... The so the premise is, honey, I shrunk the kids. You <laughs> right. know, I mean, sure. easiest pitch ever. Well, yeah, you want to talk about high concept? Yeah, I mean, uh, when we try and explain high concept in movies that doesn't belong, this is where, honey, I shrunk the kids is. Well, what is your movie about? Give me the elevator pitch. It's called Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Oh, so it's about two parents that accidentally shrink their kids. Yeah, and then that situation needs to be resolved somehow. Uh huh. Do we spend an entire movie seeing what it would be like if kids got shrunk? That's exactly what we do, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, I completely understand. In fact, I could write and direct... No, 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 no. Hold on, hold on. I oh. understand that you're already on board with the film, but let uh, me explain sure. the science behind it. Oh, sure, yeah. <laughs> so that's what I'm trying so to get you at. Only, you only have a 30-second elevator pitch to explain the science. How do you explain the science, Michael? You, uh, I have it written down as blah, blah, science. And greenlit. But that's that's kind of what I was trying to get at with all of these 80s... Sure. science films sure. for kids is that for whatever reason although you're on board with he has this laser it shrinks children yeah that's all you need in the movie yep they're still hung up on the science portion of it sure so instead they go imagine this apple as electrons yeah. and if it were smaller we could use it to shrink the space in between and then we could transport. So that's the why. And the film goes through sure. really, really stretched pains yeah. to explain why it's shrinking children. Sure. As if anybody gives a <laughs> flying fuck right. why kids are sleeping in a Lego. Well, and they talk over the audience, too. They go, you know, there's that scene where he's pitching the idea. Yeah. And he's like, oh, well, you know, obviously there's space between atoms and you can just shrink down the amount of space and then all the stuff. So I don't I don't know why you're even questioning this. All right, let's move on to the next scene. It's just such a and now we've gotten to a point. This is what I was trying to talk about. Remember, we did the year end with that email about um, uh, Rise of the Planet of the Apes. Yes. And someone had written to Great us film. saying, 
Yeah, and they had said, you know, you guys really thought the science was cool. Uh I thought all the science was wrong, and then they wrote us a lab report of why the science was The reason that I knew the science was wrong is because monkeys hadn't cured Alzheimer's in the world I live in. Right, well, that too. Yeah, there's (laughs) That's how you know the science is actually bogus, is that people haven't shrunk stuff yet. Sure, sure. Well, my retort, though, at the time, and I think yeah, I'm this sure you really, have a far better one. Well, no, actually, I want to stick to my guns on this. I had said the fact that the movie could even have that level of you could you could debate it in that sure. sense. I mean, if I want to debate the science and honey, I shrunk the kids, I would just have to go. That's not how science works. Right. That's really all I could say. Sure. If I wanted to talk about that in Rise of the Planet of the Apes, you need a lab science. Report? Yeah, I need a lab coat is what I need. The science literacy, people are all gloom and doom all the time Uh about, oh, we're getting dumber every year and people are so lazy now with their smartphones and they don't, we don't know anything. Nobody meets people in person anymore because of the social networks. Yeah, right. (laughs) Our science literacy, just as a race, has gotten so much fucking better that now we can have movies like Sunshine and yeah. Rise of the Planet of the I blame Apes. Mythbusters. Well, our science discourse is just, it's so much better yeah. that we can talk about things on such a level of science literacy. And they're not right, because as you pointed out, it's fiction. We're making stuff up. Sure. You know, you could always pick apart the science, but you can but if pick you can apart follow the, the science. Thoughts. Yeah, I mean, it just says something really great about our culture that we've gotten so much more science literate that we can we've really just a lot more science into our movies. We can talk about things on a conceptual level and then have the type of, basically we've gone from the debates that creationists have about evolution to the debate scientists have about evolution. Right. That's how far we've come since eighties movies where you just have people who know science and people who know fucking nothing. Right. Vast misunderstanding on a simple level, cannot talk about basic concepts. And now we have a science advisor on sunshine. Yeah. That's awesome. Way to go, humanity. (laughs) And science aside, the other thing that really Honey, I Shrunk the Kids does right, and I mean, they knew they did it right because it ended up in a theme park, is is that... Is what the movie's actually about. Yeah, it's that the world of Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, that backyard of, of... former title fame sure is so immersive yeah and it's just i mean it does this thing where you put yourself in a big backyard Mm -hmm. and you're terrified and ants are gigantic sure and there's a scorpion no don't talk about why there may or may not be a scorpion i wasn't gonna bring it up um but you sleep in a lego and you might get squashed by the fucking okay so who needs giant monsters in movies when there is killer rain, sure. that meteor shower sure. of, of sprinkler drops is so intense. It, well, this was the um, the Fly franchise before Cronenberg sure. redid it. You yeah. know? It was uh, tiny things are giant monsters now. And right. they are actually terrifying. Yeah. And everything is hairy. That's also yep. terrifying. Yep. Turns out when you get really small, everything has tons of hair on it and it's gross. It begs this question that is one of my fucking... So when you watch this movie with uh, somebody who maybe isn't a host of Double Feature, sure, you're going to get the person, and we haven't talked about them on the show before, but they exist in every film. Oh, no. Um, the type of person who watches Honey, I Shrunk the Kids sits back with their arms crossed and go, well, why don't they just... Climb the grass. Sure. Why don't they just uh, Why don't they just all uh, whistle again and get the dog to come out right, after right. the cat goes away? Why, doesn't why don't the they movie just, just end? Why don't they just solve it this way? Why don't they just solve it that? Because that's not what the film is about. The film sure. is about this immersive backyard. Right. I mean, when you get a situation where you can think of a solution that would have ended the film 15 minutes ago, the reason it doesn't end there is because they know it could end there, but there's other paths the film right. can take right instead of going why don't you whistle have cork take you inside oh the cat scared sure. him away why sure. don't you whistle and bring him out again it's because they want you to know they know you can bring the dog out sure but instead the film needs to explore these other avenues of of salvation and ultimately it needs children in a cereal bowl you know those people are why superhero movies suck yeah you know what i mean <laughs> they're the reason that anytime you make a superhero movie the first thing you have to do is check off 60 boxes of well people are going to wonder about this and they're going to want to know why we didn't mention this thing and they're going to want to know where captain america's wings on the side of his head went you know what I mean? yeah the, the kind of stickler people sure. those are comic book people yeah your entire audience when you make a superhero film is those fucking people yeah that's true and they ruin everything and this film just it it bites back i mean you have 
the reason is it's too cool. Yeah. It's too cool. <laughs> the reason is fuck you, audience. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to keep going. Uh, it's funny f- mentioning Captain America by total happenstance, but that is Joe Johnston who did that, who directed oh, yeah, that's this right. film. Who did uh, The Rocketeer as well, which everyone oh. keeps. Isn't that the Jennifer? No, I've almost said Jennifer Tilly. That would have been interesting. Um, Connolly? Yes. Jennifer Connolly. Yeah, people keep telling me to see that. And, so I'll uh, check that what's out. his name? The James Bond that was in uh, Hot Fuzz. And Stuart Gordon and Brian Usna are mad science people. That's where the mad science oh, comes sure. in. Not from the Captain America half. But they're, uh, it, that's kind of the reason, I think, for the reanimator vibe is uh-huh. the, their obsession with mad science from those two guys. And then Christine Sutherland is in this, who was uh, Buffy's mom in the wow. TV show, um, who is not Susan Sarandon from uh-huh. the Rocky Horror Picture Show era. Sure. People confuse those. Also confuse uh, Kimmy Robertson. Kimmy Robertson was Lucy in Twin Peaks. She was not Annie Ports from Ghostbusters. Oh. You remember the squeaky secretary from Ghostbusters? Yes. Different than the squeaky secretary from Twin Peaks, ah. who is the woman in this film. Uh-huh. Uh, none of these people matter, though. I want to talk about Rick Moranis. That's, okay. that's where well, I was going. You talk that's, about Rick Moranis. I'm going to talk confused. about Matt Frewer when you're done. Well, Rick Moranis is the dad from Gremlins, the oddball inventions guy. Yeah. He's, he's the one not creating, actually the dad from Gremlins. No, he's not. But he's the guy creating the Rube Goldberg yeah. machine that sure. butters toast. Yeah. Your Pee Wee's uh, morning Sure, routine. you got it. You got it. I mean, when you think about Honey, I Shrunk the Kids as a franchise... He is the thing that Honey, I Shrunk the Kids is about. Yeah. Every single fucking cover is, look, it's Rick Moranis being goofy again. The whole movie, I mean, it's about kids playing in a backyard, and when it's not, it's about Rick Moranis wearing a funny hat. Yep. He is wearing about seven funny hats in this movie. He's Wayne Zielinski, which is probably one of the biggest roles he's known for, outside uh-huh. of, I guess, the Ghostbusters right, thing, right? Ghostbusters. Maybe that's why people make and that, little giants. that connection. Little he pushes the plot along just as much as anything in this film. Uh-huh. It's funny given that he doesn't actually find the solution in the end. He doesn't find the kids and right. he doesn't really fix the machine. But damn it, he's out there making sure this sure. movie is going somewhere. Right. He's out in the fucking yard and he, he's the one who sees how small the chair is, his uh-huh. thinking, the thinking couch, couch or whatever. And there is that, I mean, God, you remember back to the Sunshine conversation. That was uh, talking about how big the universe is and how small and terrified that makes me feel Mm -hmm. that's how it is when i see the tiny couch yeah it's uh everything is impossibly large especially when you see the yard again the camera peers up from over that fence the yard is as big as the universe was in sunshine it is the biggest fucking thing you cannot scale across it uh it's impossible yet somehow they're the ones who who save the day you might get the impression from seeing that these kids would be impossible to find. I mean, if I were thinking about if this had actually happened to me to be the armchair guy, the arms folded guy, Uh I would go, well, that's it for those kids. They died. Yeah, there is no, but he puts on a fucking hat and he gets out there and he counterbalances himself with a bunch of cinder blocks. Well, that's the thing is the film tells you he's a smart guy and you don't often get a chance to see that because his machine sucks and nobody wants to buy it and he can't get things to work. He's like, uh, you know, down and out scientists, but he gets out there and he straps binoculars on his helmet and, uh, he fucking tries to find the kids. Yep. He tries to use his ingenuity to find the kids and he looks absurd combing over the lawn, but I think it's the eccentricity of that character. That is why he became a thing for the franchise. Yeah. It was just as much about seeing him do crazy stuff and how he would rope other people in on it because it kind of becomes this formula of Rick Moranis does something crazy on the lawn, someone raises an eyebrow, and then smash cut to that person wearing a funny hat as well, right. also combing sure. through the lawn. You know, where they're balancing on the, the pole, they have the counterweight of the TV roped on the yeah. other side, he's wearing a mining hat. Well, but the one person that almost never ends up on board is his neighbor, Russ Sr. Sure. Played by Matt Frewer, who uh, is Max Headroom. I don't know what that means. So Max Headroom, I, you, you, uh, you, maybe you haven't seen it. You should look it up. It's At the time, it was super rad. Now it's terrifying. Okay. Max Headroom was this television character um, in the 80s. Yeah. And he was basically a face in a computer. Okay. Um, kind of akin to, do you remember the Erie, Indiana episode where the kid befriends the ATM machine? Yes. Basically, like why that, I remember that, I don't know. But that is Max Headroom. 
that's not actually him, but Max Headroom was this, he was, uh, he was, he would skip and he had like a digital voice and he would kind of break and tweak. Sure. Yeah. And he was kind of, um, the crypt keeper of eighties television Sure, where he would come up between shows and be all, I'm Max he- 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 Headroom. You know, wow! And this sounds like the video drum thing yeah, that I want to see. It's absolutely fucked up as hell. But at the time, it was super cool because nobody knew what the internet was, and yeah. the fact that things could skip digitally meant that they were really cool. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> now, if somebody invented a character that skipped digitally, I would think my TV was broken. Take and it back throw to the store, the try window. and get it right. swapped. Yeah. But uh, Max Headroom, yeah, the the actor that plays Russ Senior is Max Headroom. I'm going to have to look that up. I'll try and link to it. I won't link to it on the website, but you'll go to the website and look for a link, I'm sure. Maybe it'll be there. It's a mystery. You could Google it. It's the same as having a link. You got excited about Max. You never got back to that ride. Oh. There's a Honey, I Shrunk the Kids ride, and you wanted to tell me there, about yeah, it. Yeah, there was, uh, it was called, um, so, I mean, there's there's a big Honey, I Shrunk the Kids franchise. There's Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, Honey, I Blew Up the Kid, singular, yeah, yeah. and Honey, We Shrunk Ourselves, which sure. was the lame attempt at making Wayne Zielinski the star of the film. Sure. Um, <laughs> they tried. But there's also this thing called Honey, I Shrunk the Audience. Yes. Which was uh, which was a ride at, I think, Universal, Universal Studios. Universal, sure. Uh, right around the same time as uh, the Terminator ride. When they were doing all those, you sit in the chair and it vibrates. The yeah. uh, William Castle <laughs> rebirth. Sure. sure, yeah. Honey, We Shrunk the Audience was this, uh, it was a ride where you would move through giant grass and be attacked by scorpions. It was just further immersion in the strongest part of the film, which was your backyard is a fucking jungle. Did, does it still exist? It I don't know exist if it anymore, still right? exists. Now there's Eli Roth rides instead. Right. That's probably a better place for the, the universe to well, be. Yes and no. I think that it it's a testament to Honey, I Shrunk the Kids that it's aware that it's strongest its strongest motion is its immersiveness and the world it creates by just making our world bigger. Did you just say yes or no to, let me say this again, Eli Roth ride. There's oh, yeah. an Eli Roth ride. The no. answer is yes. Yes. To Eli always Roth yes ride. and always Vegas. Always Vegas? Uh, maybe. Vegas not... until you get there. That's what you want until you get there. <laughs> that's the, that's <laughs> Vegas the other Vegas until half you're the... in Vegas? Is that what it is? Well, it's the other half of the Zack Snyder quote that you don't hear. That's yeah. what you want until you get it. Until you get to Vegas. There's two funny things about Honey, I Shrunk the Kid. Two. There's two funny things. In the scope of the film, there are two funny things that don't fit into a conversation naturally that I wanted to point out. And one is that... Um, the kids have been shrunk to the size of, of fucking bugs, smaller uh, than bugs, smaller right? Smaller than bugs. They are lost. They might be fucking dead. And we're worried they're having premarital sex. <laughs> that is <laughs> right. primary concern. I think Stuart Gordon especially and Brian Usna have to be making a joke after the other films they've made. Oh, and, yeah. Um, that thing where I hyperactively talked at Stuart Gordon for about five seconds on our show uh, during one of the Music Box shows. He was talking about nudity and everything was super cool. And, you know, we talked for a little bit. I don't know if it was in the thing or not, but we talked a little bit about the treatment of sexuality between younger kids and the age that kids actually come into that Uh and how that's portrayed in film. And so to put that joke in there that, you know, the movie does not treat it like a joke at all. And this is a movie that treats its jokes like jokes, even to wink at them at the end of the fucking movie to call them out. But uh, there's just a moment where their mom is overly concerned. And I uh-huh. think uh, I think it's one of those jokes they got in kind of under the radar. Sure. And the second one is Russ Sr. No, I've actually filled my quota of being able to talk about hats uh, per an episode of Double Feature. The other thing I thought was funny, and this actually it goes back to another Stuart Gordon thing, is fucking with the pets. Yeah. There is a moment where they go, we have to try it on something living. And they show the dog yeah. run out of the room. And it shows that the the fucking camera shows us the dog just long enough to remind us that it's an option before we see that none of the humans even consider it as an option. They go, well, let's all argue over which person will take it because uh-huh. nobody wants to put the dog in front of the machine. Right. Fucking awful. Once they figure out that machine, though, they're done. They yep. flip a switch. They say, oh, it works. Okay, push this button. All right, good. The film's over. Total solution. The Zelinskis will go down in infamy, and the kids are back to normal size. Let's play with it some more. Yeah, there's no buildup of, oh, well, what about when we put it on? Oh, it's running out of bat. Oh, we, there's yep. only so many. It's just, oh, put the kids in front of it. Oh, yeah. now they're big. Okay, movie's over. Right. Well, movie's not over until we make the food big, which I love because that's actually, when science makes progress, we get things like bigger food, yep. and it's beautiful. That's what you actually use a shrinking growth size laser thing for. 
email us how you get your friends to watch Spy Kids or something inaccurate about the science and Honey, I Shrunk the Kid, <laughs> double feature show at gmail.com. Actually, email us those things. I know we make a joke at the end of every show, but we do read the emails. Also, shrink your pets. Send us I, photos of your shrunken pets. Of your shrunken pets. Our audience knows how to use Photoshop very poorly, and I love when we ask them. And I love when we ask them for pictures. Uh, what are we going to do on the show next time? More children's films? No, next time we're going to we're gonna kick off horror time. Oh, shit, again. it's October, and that's an arbitrary period of time where people like to talk about horror films more than usual. <laughs> where Great. they let us get away with that horror works, films. That works for us really <laughs> fucking well. Where do we begin? We're going to begin with The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari and great Cabin in the Woods. Oh, great place to end as well. That'll be the entire month of October. <laughs> No, I think we're actually going to put out a show every week for the month of October. Can wow. you believe that? Look at every us. single week. A pet on the back for double feature. Watch more fucking film. Bye.